Hello, my name is Maurice Gran. I'm one of the co-writers of Goodnight Sweetheart. And my name is Lawrence Marks, and I'm the other. Welcome to our front room. As you can see, we've had the decorators in recently. We're rather happy with the, the way it's turned out. They're coming back to finish it in about a fortnight, aren't they? Yes, I'm going to paint it all white. Lawrence and I met a long time ago. We grew up in the same neighbourhood, Finsbury Park in North London, home of Arsenal Football Club. And we were aware of each other in our early teens, but the first time we properly met was probably in Brighton in 1965, was it 65? Yes, I think that's when we got to know each other. I think we'd met earlier than that. I think we met at 10, age 10 in a hall, school hall in North London, where a military parade was taking place and we were both on it. Yeah, that's a good one, isn't it? We were members of the Jewish Lads Brigade and we were lads and we were Jewish and so we used to march up and down in the school hall. Um, but I, we... I wasn't aware of Morris then. I mean, he was in the same platoon um, and we were being... I was undercover, you see, so I didn't know I was there. Um... I was a spy. And being a little bit older than Morris, of course, our paths never really crossed. We never went to the same schools ever. Um, and it was, as Morris rightly says, in um, 1965 that we both went on holiday. Oh, maybe it was 64. It was 65. And we both went to Brighton, Salt Dean, Butlins. As a coincidence, I was there with a couple of with my friend, Lawrence was there with his crowd, and we sort of hooked up. Um, we were writing Love Hurts at the time, and um, the word idea actually is very interesting because there was never an idea for Goodnight Sweetheart. What happened was we were writing Love Hurts and we were working out a scene that was giving us some small problem. A scene set in the east end of London, probably somewhere along Whitechapel Road. Um, in fact, we had discussed that the two characters in Love Hurts would meet and go over to Bloom's, which was a kosher restaurant then in Whitechapel Road, since being closed down. And we were trying to work out this scene, and I said, for some reason, in a moment of distraction to Morris, that do you know that if we actually went backwards from this scene, I mean, f geographically backwards, there are certain streets in this area that are locked in 1940. I haven't changed a bit since 1940. And I recall Morris, without looking up, saying, I think you've just created our next series. That's as I recall. Uncanny, isn't it? Which was interesting in a way because a similar event had happened in reverse with Birds of a Feather. So when you use, or when we use the, the word idea as, a, as, as if we had been thinking about the way or shape of a next series, it never came quite like that. It, with Goodnight Sweetheart, it almost came down a passage of time. Spooky. When we wrote Good Night, Sweetheart, that was about 10 or 12 years ago, and um, it was a lot easier to get a TV show on television then than it is now. We had a very good relationship with the BBC. They were looking forward to our next comedy because Birds of a Feather was really a big hit. So we told the then head of Light Entertainment we had an idea about a man who's in love with two women, one of whom is probably dead, and uh, we explained a bit more about it. And he said something like, I don't understand what you're talking about. I'm sure you'll make it funny. Go away and do it. So we went away and did it. And I think it probably took about six months from having the idea and writing the first script and getting that approved. And then we wrote the remainder, didn't we? Um, it wasn't a very long process, was it? Yeah, I think it probably... the first series took about... Mm, a year? I kind of thought less than that. Well, I'm thinking about from the first idea to actually getting it in yeah, onto probably television. Yeah, probably yeah. Whereas now, you have an idea, you smuggle it into the BBC, um, it goes through the committee of a thousand, and 12 years later they say to you, what was that idea again? So it's not quite as quick as it used to be. We didn't know Nicholas Lindhurst. We only knew, of course, he's Rodney in Only Fools and Horses. Was and, he Rodney? And, and, uh, he was, I think he was, or, or Adele. He was one of the two in Only Fools and Horses. Never knew that. Had seen him in Butterflies. Had seen him perform. He was, he was good. We also had seen him on the stage 
which was interesting too. But nonetheless, because we knew the character we wanted to create had to be very sympathetic. After all, we were writing a comedy series about adultery. So we didn't want people to say, well, I don't want to watch this. I mean, who wants to watch about a man having an affair with two, or having an affair with a woman whilst married to another? And we meet both of them in a comedy series. It really wouldn't have gone down well. So Nick Lindhurst to me me and and to Morris uh, and to the other people that were working at Alamo to whom we suggested it, thought it was a very good idea. So what we did was what we've done with many of our shows, and that's just get in touch with the agent and say, where... Lawrence and Morris, and we want to write a new show, and we'd like to meet Nick if, if he would... if he, w- We were a little bit lucky because, having made that first approach, we happened to be sitting on the same table as Nicholas Lindhurst's agent at the evening we won the BAFTA Writers' Award. And she was on our table with one of her clients, I think it was Alan Bates. And so we got to know her a little bit. She arranged a lunch with Nick Lindhurst, and he arrived, and he was very quiet, and he was very shy. He had lamb chops, I seem to remember. And he also had this peak cap pulled right over his face, so no one would know who he was, nobody could recognise him. And we explained to him, as Morris has explained, we explained to the head of BBC Comedy, this bizarre idea of a man who walks through a time portal into the Blitz meets the barmaid, falls in love, and then conducts a, a, relation, a dual relationship. And he was very taken with the idea, and he said, as I recall, if I like the first script, yes, I'm up for it. In those days, I make it sound like 50 years ago, but um, the BBC worked in a way that if you went in with a project by Lawrence and Morris and with Nick Lindhurst in the lead, they weren't really too concerned what it was about, in truth, because they thought you've got all the components of a hit show. And so it turned out. We were involved in casting all the characters, or the the main five, five or six, and um, I think it was one of the most satisfying shows in terms of how uh, they worked out. Nick, as we've said, we knew... We knew him before. Dervler we'd seen in a, in a drama series. Um, the others we'd seen in, in various things, often playing very different characters. Both Vic and Chris had played... Vic had played a journalist, hadn't he? And, 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 and Chris had played a sleazy accountant in, uh, in Love Hurt, so quite different to the sort of character he plays. Yeah, we were really, really delighted with them. And, and uh, in, in fact, even the, the small parts um, all the way through. One thing um, we, I, I noticed was that when we did Love Hurts, extras uh, or non-speaking uh, actors were more prepared to have the hair cut. When we did Shannon Harvey Moon in the early 80s, there was a lot more trouble getting people to cut their hair off to be in a period piece. I also think we shouldn't underestimate the contribution of John Bartlett, the producer, because when Morris and I were not there during this casting period or planning period or set design period, because of course we were writing other shows at the time, John Bartlett was a tower um, and he really took it on as his show as much as it was ours. It was a great team all the way through. Sounds a bit American that, but it's true. No, we don't know any PC Deadman as such. If you look at the Metropolitan Police's clear-up rate, I imagine there's quite a few of them in reality. That's just about 8%. Um, but I, don't, I think that when you create a character's yeah. name, there is a group of people that do name checks, so you won't embarrass a PC oh, Deadman be a real one, that's right. that, that would be in the current Met. So we presume that there isn't a real PC Deadman, and the PC Deadman of our imagination uh, came about... How? I think probably we knew that the only men that would be in the neighbourhood at that time were people that were not called up to join the armed services. My father was a policeman um, it, during the war, um, and uh, I suppose I must have unconsciously been thinking that in the east end of London at that time would have been policemen that weren't called up, either by choice or by age or by illness. Um, and Deadman seemed a really interesting character because here was a man who was back in London with his wife, we presume. I think we later learned he, he, he was. He was, he was very... Ha- she was very friendly, though, to Hands-on, ca- I think. Very hands-on mm. with Canadian airmen. 
Um, and um, I think that, you know, having a policeman there really kind of gave it an authority. Um, no one would pull one over on Deadman. It was just that Deadman couldn't see if anybody was. But we and like, it became very easy to write for. We've always had a soft spot for twits, you know. Um, because but it's when true, you're writing yeah. comedy, it's always good to have a twit up your sleeve. Yeah. But I don't think he was that stupid. I oh, he was. Think he was very slow. I think it's what they used to call in school, we did he's one, a slow child. We did one episode, we didn't, I don't think we wrote it, in a later series where he got hit on the head by a piece of shrapnel and became really clever for an episode. That was quite funny. Then he got hit on the head again and went stupid again. It was a very odd gag. But I suppose they don't make policemen like P.C. Deadman anymore. Oh. Dervla announced that she wanted to stop. She, um, which <laughs> was a bit of a pain to be truthful, um, but, you know, she'd done three series and like lots of actors, she just didn't want to be in a long-running show. Um, I don't think when it started she necessarily imagined it was going to run that long. She probably thought if it ran two or three years that would be it. And subsequently she also took a dive out of Bally Kiss Angel after three series. Um, it was just one of those things. She was terrific in the show and we were very lucky that when we replaced her with Liz Carling we got someone as good who, who looked like Dervla. Um, so we were hoping the viewers hadn't noticed. We, we don't get that much feedback directly, um, do we, of, of, of which Yvonne or which Phoebe people like. I think people remember more the stories they enjoy than the people who are in the yeah. stories. I mean, they're never going to say, I like that episode without Gary, because, of course, he was in yeah. them. But um, I think that people liked or, or, or would refer to us, and the rare occasion they do, stories more than characters. Um, they accept the characters as who they are. It's a long-held belief in this country, not so in America, that if one of your stars decides not to do any more, you have to cancel the show. We didn't want to do that. Whilst we had Nick Lindhurst, you replace. Um, no one's irreplaceable. Perhaps not even Nick, but that never came to the point that we had I to find out. I think Nick would be irreplaceable, because we were a different show. But I think that... Um, we did make a conscious decision between you know, when, when, when Yvonne was recast to write her a bit softer because uh, of the, we probably had had exhausted that, the seam of her giving him a really hard time. So in the last series, is, she gave him only a mildly hard time. Well, she was climbing the ladder of her own success. Yeah. So her she was less frustrated as a yes. character. She, we got into the political thing and the um, alternative therapies sort of world. I can honestly say that nobody has ever said to me, um, I prefer one set or the other set. I think a general rule of thumb is that if you write a really good comedy series, the first series is the one that's remembered, even when it's forgotten. That's deep. <laughs> I think all, we always plan for a long-running series of, of, of anything we write. Whether it hits is a um, coming together of a lot of, 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 of conditions. I mean, when we wrote Harvey Moon, the first show, which was watched by, I think, 18 million people, was because it snowed that afternoon. A Friday afternoon, London, uh, England, Britain was, was caught in a major blizzard and no one went out that night, so they watched television and the show was liked and becoming fair. We had a feeling with Goodnight Sweetheart, as I recall, that it was very, very unusual. And I think that both exhilarated you and worried you. Was it a bit too left field for, for what we're used to on, on, on British mainstream television? But it did have Nicholas Lindhurst in it, so that was some kind of guarantee. That was uh, some kind of insurance policy. Uh, I don't think that the audience would have known too many other of the actors in the well, part. The truth, of the, the truth is, of course, you can't predict. We've had, we've had shows which we've had, you know, high hopes for, which haven't gone on. Um, we don't think that makes them worse shows. It's just the way you know, some things the audience go for and some things they don't. And I think um, it was a good combination of the cast, the idea. I think the fact that the 
flashbacks, the wartime stuff, was played really pretty straight. It wasn't, you know, we didn't compete with a lower low on the sort of the funny war basis. You know, our war was scary. Also, um, I think we should remember that the first series of Goodnight Sweetheart, by our own standards, did okay. It didn't do better than okay. I think it was about eight, nine million people. They repeated it um, some months later on a Monday night, running into the second series, and that's when it really took off. And I think the policy, or the old policy of BBC Repeats, helped shows no end, and I think that um, Goodnight Sweetheart was a beneficiary of that, that, that uh, repeat policy. At the time, eight or nine million wasn't was bad. a good figure, but it wasn't a startlingly good figure. It, I mean, this it, is, this is, this it returned is, with 11. Yeah, this is you know, 1993, before Channel 5, before what the, the, the penetration of satellite and cable to the degree it is now, before you could watch shows on DVD. Well, Lawrence and I both went to a writer's group that, that we sort of stumbled on, this is ages ago, so 30 years ago, um, which used to meet on a Monday night and people would bring their work along, their plays along, to be read and discussed. Um, and we started going there, it was, a, it was a cheap night out as much as anything else, and we started writing bits and pieces, um, sketches and so on, and then they seemed to go down quite well, and then the guy who was the secretary of the group um, suggested we try and write something together, which we did, and, it, uh, and, we, and we just managed to work together. Um, so it was really that suggestion. Whether we would have done so otherwise, I've really no idea. We were also the um, first kind of writers at this workshop Morris has talked about that wanted to write television comedy. Most of the work that was on at this group called Player Playwrights, which we still attend, 30 years on, um, were performing radio plays and stage plays. Um, and we came along wanting to write the medium we loved, um, which, was, which was television comedy. So it was rather new for them too, but uh, we certainly learned our craft there, um, more so than anywhere else that we've ever been since. We learned through um, members of the audience what drama was really all about. And I don't think you can write comedy until you've understood drama properly. One of the best things new writers can do is to, to find a writer's group. If you, you know, if you live in a, and people who live in a, in a city, there's, there's bound to be a writer's group or students at you know, colleges. Harder maybe if you live in the sticks. But yes, to find a writer's group where your work can be put on, discussed, analysed. We were lucky because this group we went to, um, there were people in the audience who didn't pull their punches, and if they thought you'd written something that didn't work, they'd tell you, but they'd also tell you why they thought it didn't work. And when we worked with new writers in London, you know, we direct them to that group. There's a lot more uh, university courses now for writers um, who want to become us, I suppose. I mean, if, if, if comedy is their, their field. Um, and so there, was a, there seems to be now, in, in, in this year, uh, this time, very, very many more places for new writers to s learn their craft than there ever was when we started. We were just lucky. We stumbled upon this place that seemed to be just the right place at the right time with the right people in the audience, great drama critics, I mean proper drama critics, people that would have been um, your teachers had you gone to some f university to do a creative writing course. But they were better than creative writing. They, they knew their drama inside out. And yes, of course you must. And another thing we learned along the road was um, you have to hear your work. Uh, what's written on the page is never the same as how it sounds. And until you hear your work read out loud, can you hear the rhythm? Can you hear whether there are too many words, not enough visual interpretations in the script or that of visual direction? Um, and it's a very good practice for, I would recommend strongly for anybody that wants to write comedy um, to, to, to go or even get their friends around and say, right, you're playing this character, you're playing that character, let's just read it and hear it. And we got that early, so that was a good stroke of luck for us. We write in this room, as you can see, it's being redecorated at the moment, um, 
because I find Morris's idea of brown wooden panelling a bit too Victorian for my taste. And we have a sort of series of very pretty little Filipino girls who come in and take things down for us. What a terrible gag that was. We work on a computer. Uh, we work in the same room. Uh, we argue all day long and at the and then sort of write something down and, and we um, spend probably more than half the time that a script takes is spent thrashing out the story and all the details and who does what and he wouldn't do that and she wouldn't do that and don't be so stupid and bloody the idea and then we sort of from that we get a sort of outcome and that's the script we've always written together we've always argued there have been writers on good night sweetheart who do work in separate rooms i mean um i think of of two writers that wrote some of some excellent episodes of Good Night Sweetheart, Gary Lawson and John Phelps, who, in our experience of their working procedure, have been in different rooms. But that's not the way Morris and I want to do it because, um, because it's so much more fun being together. I mean, and you've also got some kind of gauge of whether what you've said is funny or whether an idea works or doesn't work. Morris mentions we sit and argue all day, and many people laugh that off as being a flip the comment, but that's in fact what we do. Um, without that, that sort of abrasion, that rubbing up against each other, uh, uh, metaphorically, metaphorically, of course, um, <laughs> can we um, reach an idea? And when we had, when Morris did say, as I, I mentioned earlier, I think you've just created our next idea, he saw something that I would not have seen had I worked on my own. Good night, sweetheart, would not have been born had we not worked in the same room. So it's good to have ideas bouncing off each other because. Where do you bounce them if not off each other? I mean, against a wall, and if it doesn't come back, what do you do? You know, um, get a new wall. We are getting new walls. In yes, fact, yes, we're waiting for this that, Filipino yeah. girl to come in and take these down. As you were. My favourite storyline is when my wife came home and found me in bed with another woman and I said she was selling encyclopedias and I was trying to get a discount. Um, but if you mean what my favourite storylines in Good Night Sweetheart, um, in series one, which I suppose we should limit ourselves to for the moment because otherwise customers will get very cross, I suppose to be, to be boring about it, I think episode one, although the first scene goes on a bit, really is a very good first episode and and i'm very fond of episode one because it, that's what sold the idea to the bbc i think the uh introduction of half a dozen major characters as well as nick's character we did pretty well and i think at the end of it all we really knew uh knew them and i love the and it's got my favorite gags in the whole 60 umpteen episodes which is the uh the Kiss of Life sequence. I'm very partial to that. Yeah, I like episode six of the first series best of all, and I like it because not only do we play with time, which is, of course, the theme, but we play with artefacts. I mean, in episode six, we use a Pathé News film to get the denouement of the episode, um, which I thought was rather clever at the time, that you could use something in a film and then start playing with the film in a... In other words, Gary Sparrow is in a Pathé news room from 1940. How did he get there? So Yvonne would have been wondering. And also I thought it was a very... I think it was the turning point in the whole series. I feel that that was the moment when we felt um, we're writing this with real confidence now and that we knew a second series was booked. There was going to be ten of them, not six. We were one of the very few companies, if not the only company, that was supplying comedy in more than groups of six, we realised that we could, there would never be any problem with storylines really because if we just say we're now going to move from 1940 into 1941, the question was what was happening in 1941 that we could feed back into any story we wanted to create. So six really was a kick-off point. I understand Morris when he says number one because writing the first episode is the hardest thing in the world. I mean any number of dramas that you see on television that's lauded and applauded um, is far easier to write than a f the first half hour of a comedy. And that first one, as Morris has said, with the exception, in my opinion, of an overlong first scene, does the job very, very well, and you know where you're going and you know where you are. 
And of course, when people say, what's your setting, as often is asked of a writer when he comes up with a new idea, here we had two new settings. You know, we, had, we, we were able to say, there isn't a setting, there are two settings. And that's really what confused a lot of producers, uh, the, particularly the director of Good Night Sweetheart, because when we explained to him this idea we had, he said, I don't begin to understand what you're talking about, but it sounds rather interesting. Um, that was one of Harold Wilson's first TV shows, wasn't it? <laughs> um, he reminded me of Harold Wilson, but he was a very fine director. I think Good Night Sweetheart is one of my favourite shows of all the stuff we've done over the years. Um, I'm very fond of that. I I suppose. In some ways, my favourite show could possibly be The New Statesman, simply because it was so much fun to do, although it was incre incredibly hard work. But there's never been a studio night like a New Statesman studio night of like two hours of non-stop hysteria, to the extent you had to sometimes calm the audience down. You need, you need a warm-up guy, you needed a cool-down guy. And that, so that was a real riot. It was the only show where Lawrence and I always sat in the audience because it was too much fun to miss. The writers that most influenced us at the top of the league has to be Dick Clement and Ian Lafreni, who wrote Porridge and The Likely Lads and Now Be His Own Pet. Um, when we saw Porridge individually, I mean, we didn't sit down together and watch it, um, we both knew that this was really about as good as comedy was going to get on television for lots of different reasons, but not least the writing, the elegance of the writing, the structure of the writing, the plotting, all the things you would try and teach new writers to do, they seem to do week in, week out um, with a wonderful cast and Porridge was something not to be missed. I ought to say that at the same time um, that Porridge was being transmitted, which I suppose was about the middle 70s, there were other shows that were really good, and I think of The Good Life, I think of Rising Damp, Reginald Perrin, Forty Towers. Forty Towers. So we were watching and learning from what we were seeing at, a, at what you would call a golden age of television comedy. I don't suppose it was any more golden than... I think it was a little bit more golden. I think what all those shows had in common, and, th and this is a brand new original thought, I've only just had it, was that I don't think a single one of them could be successfully pitched today. I don't think you could pitch a show about a middle class couple who grow food in their garden. I don't think you could sell a show about a mad hotel keeper. I'm sure you couldn't sell a show about um, a sleazy landlord trying to get off with one of his lodgers. Uh, not a show, uh, a, show set in, a show set in prison would be because it was a bit of a downer. And, um, and what was the other one? Well, I suppose Reggie Perrin. Reggie Perrin about a, a, a bloke having a nervous breakdown who thinks his mother's hippo hippopotamus. So none of those shows have got made today. But I think Dick Clement and Neil and Frenny, and what was so wonderful about how life can be is that Dick Clement and Neil and Frenny formed their own independent television company in about 1981 called Wits End Productions. And Morris and I, who were just starting out, had had one hit show, was sent along to see the man looking after this company, and consequently we created Shine on Harvey Moon for this company and met our heroes. And we met our heroes really early and found them to be every bit as... Evil, twisted, I'm oh, sorry, as nice and as helpful as we'd hoped. They were, and they were really clever too. They knew how to do it, and I hope that perhaps we've done that for one or two writers since. I doubt it. I think also I wouldn't leave that a question about who are your favourite writers without mentioning Galton and Simpson too, um, because um, Hancock's Half Hour, I was very, very young when that was on radio, I mean, but I remember it at Sunday lunch times. Um, and I don't think anyone that writes comedy um, that understands the history of television or radio comedy could ignore those writers because Hancock's Half Hour was very, very important and Steptoe and Son perhaps even more important than Porridge in terms of the way comedy was going to go forward. Galton and Simpson were innovators and they were very, very important and I don't even think um, 
or I, I would go so far as to say that no writers of comedy since Steptoe and Son could not look back and say this is where it all came from. So I think Gordon Simpson and Clement Lafrenet would be our greatest influences. Whereas we know Clement Lafrenet, you know, and Gordon Simpson quite well, we don't really know uh, Perry and Croft. We've met them a couple of times, and you know, at functions and said hello, nice to meet you. Still wearing the lurid jackets in Jimmy's case, but we've never ever had a chance to sit down and and um, chat with them. Um, I mean, there's no question that that uh, Dad's Army is uh, one of the you know standout shows of, of, of British comedy. You know, it um, it still plays. I mean, possibly because it was a period piece when it was written, it plays really well today, better perhaps than Steptoe does, for example. It was a cracking show, no question about it. Interesting uh, connection between Goodnight Sweetheart and Perry and Croft, in as much as that in a later series of Goodnight Sweetheart, Morris and I decided to write a scene in which Gary goes to borrow some money from the bank, and the bank manager is Mr. Mannering, and his um, sidekick is Mr. Uh, Mr. Wilson, and there's a young sort of gopher called Pike. Exactly now, called Pike. Wasn't he? No, he's called Major. Major. He was a, at the time of the Major government, and, and he was our capitalist. Well, in order, in order to do this, our producer, John Bartlett, had to contact Perry and Croft to see if we could use his, their characters in our series, and they were only too pleased I to oblige. Yeah, I think we gave him a few quid and a crate of whiskey. But and a, and uh, it a was, lurid jacket. It was great fun to do. In one of your lurid jackets. Yes, yeah. it was funny. Um, but uh, I don't know why we should be compared to Croft and Perry, because I find our style of writing very different to theirs. Gorton and Simpson, you would like to be compared to. I mean, Gorton and Simpson did things nobody else was doing. I don't think Morris and I are such great innovators. Gorton and Simpson took the Royal Court Theatre of the late 50s um, and, and Pinterest drama of the early 60s and put it into Steptoe and Son. I mean, nobody had ever seen anything. I think Zed Cars and Steptoe and Son were, were real groundbreaking shows. I'm not sure that Morris and I have ever made groundbreaking shows, although some might say that no one had ever seen anything like Goodnight Sweetheart. But um, I think, you know, Gordon and Simpson were, were ahead of the game by... We don't mind who we're compared to, as long as it doesn't lead to begging letters. Well, Gordon and Simpson write terrible begging no, letters no, no, to us. Don't, don't, don't embarrass them. Okay. Well, I would choose, if I could travel back in time, to go to Berlin in the late 20s and very early 30s. I think the, the time of Bertolt Brecht um, and um, Lottie Lenya and that period, I think it would be absolutely fantastic. Everything was happening. It was like a cauldron of excitement. To get a damn good thrashing from the passing brown shirt, it's worth it to go to the cabaret, isn't it, Laura? Well, I don't know. Gary Sparrow <laughs> risked going back yeah, Gary, to the Blitz yeah. where there were bombs foot dropping. He could have been killed equally. I think, I think we have the great good fortune, those of us born just after the Second World War, to have lived in one of the sort of best periods of time. So when I, I thought a lot about this question, and... Um, I think I would go back two years. So instead of, if I could have been, I was born in 1949, so I was about 13 when the Beatles came out, and about 14 or 15 when you could buy Purple Hearts and Dance All Night, and I wasn't allowed to. So if I'd been like two or three years older, yeah. I would have just been right for a whole swinging London, King's Road, could have got off with Marianne Faithful. I was just two years too young for like a whole fantastic stuff. And I was just right, you see. You know, and you, so yeah, but you really were in Berlin, you were just wasting your time in Berlin. Well, I having come back from Berlin, having survived the beating yeah. from the brown shirts when I came out of, out of clubs like uh, Sally Bowles was singing in, um, I'd swap forward to the 60s, but I did live through the 60s, uh, that very important time. I was in the right place at the right time of the right decade of the century. But I suspect that Lawrence was still a couple of years too long, because Alan McEwen, who was our third part of Alamo, our production company, who was about four years older than us, he just had it all and has a penicillin to prove it. World War Two fascinates me because having spoken to me, much of my family. I have a brother and sister who are um, pre-war children. 
Uh, both were evacuated during the war. They had their own stories to tell. They're very sad stories. Um, but nonetheless, they um, are stories the likes of which I can't understand. My parents had very different wars, and their stories are very interesting too. Aunts and uncles had fascinating wars. I think the common thread is, is that this period of time, this 1939 to 45, changed people's lives in a way they could never have imagined in 1938. Um, people were doing things they would never have done. Um, children were able to suddenly see another side of life that they might never have seen. I'm talking about East End kids that were evacuated to country houses in, in Wiltshire, if you like, and suddenly the mother and father of that house took this child under its wing and suddenly it was introduced to literature and knew that when it came back to London in 45 it wanted to be a writer, for example. And I have been intrigued by this sort of social change that occurred in those years. We tried to put that into Goodnight Sweetheart as best we could and in fact many of the speeches in the DVD given by uh, Phoebe is challenging her to think about the concept of marriage, if you like which changed during the war. Many women had affairs during the war because there were few men around. I mean, all young men were not there. Until the Americans came over in about 43, 44, uh, all you had were people like Deadman, and you weren't going to have an affair with somebody like Deadman, not least because his wife was at home too. Uh, so people's eyes were opened, and, and places were possible to go to that you would never have gone before, and books and papers and writing were possible to read, and things that you never heard before because that wasn't in your realm. Everything became possible, and I like decades or periods of time in history where the impossible becomes possible, and I think that, to a large extent, was what Goodnight Sweetheart was all about. I don't know if Morris agrees with me. Perhaps he doesn't. Um, well, I don't... I think what Lawrence said was very interesting, and so uh, what I have to say is so trivial and pathetic in comparison that it's hardly worth even using up the small amount of oxygen required. Or tape. Or tape. But I will say that I suppose any you know young North London Jewish kid grew up more obsessed about the war uh, than if he hadn't been Jewish. That's why I think it was something which is part you know, of, your, of your culture, that whole question, you know, because... Um, because what was happening elsewhere? Because, yeah, because, you know, the, I realised at a fairly early age that if things had turned out differently, my parents would have been lampshades, and lampshades don't often have children, so I probably wouldn't have been born. So to that extent, um, you know, I'm quite glad things turned out the way they did. Um, Lawrence is a tremendous one for putting an optimistic gloss on things, because he sees Berlin in the throes of depression and the rise of Hitler as a place for a night out. And the first and the Second World War, with all its massive destructions, an opportunity to read newspapers otherwise denied you. Well, let me ask so, you the question. So, 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 I think, I think, if only he didn't hate Tony Blair so much, how much good could he do him? So, but when would you have wanted to live through boring times, the fifties? No, 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 no. I'm, just, I'm just saying, I don't. America I now? No, no. I'm just no, no, no. That's, that answered my question. I just wanted to be sixteen in 1963 and not thirteen in 1963. Not a lot to ask. But you were sixteen in 1966. Yeah, it was different. It was all finished by then. No, not quite. Perhaps we ought to do a series, another Good Night Sweet, a reprise of Good Night Sweet, where he actually comes back into the sixties. Yeah, no reprise. Was it? Okay. When we find an up-and-coming writer um, of, of promise, we normally send some big blokes round to threaten them. And so far, it's been pretty lucky, because I can only think of a couple of writers who've actually persevered despite our threats, which is why there are so few good writers knocking around at the moment. I suppose the boy Gervais is quite promising. Um, but there are some, you know, Speaking for myself, there are some shows in the last two or three years which I've really enjoyed, um, but they aren't necessarily situation comedies. Um, you know, I like Green Wing, I like League of Gentlemen, I like Black Books, but any Black Books really is sort of nearly a conventional sitcom. Um, so there is good work being done, but it's, it's much more um, hard to spot the writer and, and, and 
to my shame, you know, I know that Green Wing has got between four and 73 writers, but I don't know their names. I don't think writers sort of weave themselves into the sort of fabric of television like they used to. I mean, you know, we mentioned earlier Galton and Simpson. If you said to people that never watch television comedy, Galton and Simpson, they'd know the names. It's true of our names too. Lots of people say, I know who you are, but I can't quite recall what you've done. Didn't you do, you know, that kind of thing. It doesn't happen anymore because... Didn't you kill my brother, they often say. We said we did write, didn't you kill my brother, but it only went for one series. I, th I mean... So I don't think that writers today actually get... I mean, the speed of the credits as well. Yeah. You're not yeah, going to get to. You're not going to get to see a writer's name that much. And the serious mum, and you freeze frame it. I also think you know that because everything takes so long to do on television now, um, and because the fashion through a misreading of Forty Towers is that I will just do two series and stop because John Cleese just did two series and stopped. I think John would have kept on if his marriage to his co-writer hadn't been breaking up at the time. Um, so, following on us. Um, you know, Simon Nye, for example, is a tremendous output and a, and a really good writer. It's actually quite hard now to have that big a career because it all just takes so long to do. No. <laughs> no. I don't think we could collaborate with other writers in a three-way collaboration. If Lawrence, you know, decides to spend six months a year travelling, because he loves travel, uh, in, a year, in a year or time travelling, time travelling's fine because you can come up before you leave and actually have more time to work, but assuming Lawrence didn't do that, but spend his time travelling in a conventional sense, or I was wanting to work and he didn't, then it would be interesting who would I, you know, who would I want to work with? Um, and I can't really imagine you know, because our relationship is so um, long-standing, I can't imagine who else I'd want to split the money with. I'd rather, you know, I could imagine maybe, you know, producing a show with other writers, but I don't think I'd sit in a room with another writer. But Lawrence can answer. He may have someone untouched. No, I just think that on the occasions that I've been asked to mentor writers, That's where, what he calls it, where, where, yes. where you work with a, a new writer trying to get their work off the ground, it's slightly different. You're, you're putting in a different part of yourself into the world. No, the answer, as Morris said originally, no. I think the reason Beatles music runs through our shows, and it doesn't really run through our shows, although Morris will explain why it has been prominent in some of our shows. Um, well, because of when, you know, the age we are, the Beatles, you know, were very important to us. We, you know, we were 13, 14 when that all started. Um, not as, obviously, crucial as had we been in Liverpool going to the Cavern Club. But they were just sort of part of our youth. And, and, and for me, you know, I sort of think now that they, you know, they were my long-lost big brothers because they did the things you wanted to do, you know, made music, got drunk had birds, made money, lost it, made more money, had more birds, made more music, what more can you possibly ask? And so they've always been very important to us, and more and more as time goes on. I mean, you know, when my kids were little, you know, the only thing they'd listen to in the car was, was, uh, was, was Beatles stuff, which they thought were old English folk songs, which of course they are in a way. So they were, but the only time we really, so another thing, Goodnight Sweetheart, I don't think we set out to say that Gary would do Beatles songs. In fact, the first two songs he did in the pilot weren't. weren't. But as time went on, it just became the case. There were some great Beatles songs. There was Yesterday, which summed up the situation in one episode. And in the later series, when they'd all got stoned by accident on some drug that someone had brought back, um, they were all sitting under the stage during an air raid um, singing I'm, I'm a Walrus, walrus. Yeah. Um, which again it was just so ridiculous that we, we thought Well we funny. did that because of this, the words I mean it was just funny seeing all these people dressed in, in, in the gear of the so, so really it was just very f fruitful but we'd done a big Beatles thing on a series called Get Back where because Get Back is a Beatles title and it also was a good title for the series we decided that every single episode would have a Beatles 
theme would be a Beatles uh, oh. title, and every single character in the show would be a character from a Beatles song, um, which we cheated a bit because one character was from a Paul McCartney song, so sorry but about I that. I think I recall Eleanor from Eleanor Rigby was played by Kate Winslet. So Kate Winslet was our Eleanor, and there was, um, there was Bungalow Bill, wasn't there? Yeah. And uh, Loretta and Martin Sweet. I mean, you have to work all these things out. We were the originators of SAD. Yes. Um, I think one of the questions Morris and I always debated was, if it has to end, when does it end? And VE night seemed to be a good time to end this saga, because that's when the real saga ended for many people. VE night for younger viewers was the end of the war in Europe. I'm sorry, I want to spell that out. Victory in Europe night. Um, what we didn't know, and I don't remember discussing it, was whether Gary would find himself or wanting to stay in 1945 or 1999? Well, I remember, I remember pretty clearly that when we knew, which we always sort of knew, that we would finish the show around the t you know, with an episode at the end of the Second World War, and Lawrence and I, as, uh, as people may know, didn't write all the shows after Series 1. We wrote about a quarter of the shows, and our team wrote the others. We knew, of course, we'd write the, the final episode of the lot. And we had to decide, when we were planning the last series, what would happen, um, without giving too much away, there had to be a conclusion of some kind, and that conclusion had to involve deciding whether Gary stayed in the present or stayed in the past. We didn't think he could just go on having his cake and eating it. Um, and once we decided, then we had to work out um, the story. and and, and I think a lot of the things that were going on in the last series um, helped make the last story really interesting. You know, we'd, we'd introduced a lot of new thoughts. I think that we, we you, at the end of a series, which is essentially a sort of romantic series, you need, it's got to be sad as well as, well as happy. It's got to be bittersweet. So whichever way it was going, one wife or another was going to have a nasty shot. But sure, we'll save that for dot, the... Dot, 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 as we say. I suppose you could say we're going legit, as, because we've written the stage play. That's legitimate for younger people. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, as against illegitimate. <laughs> uh, because we've written the stage play, which was great fun, which is going to be produced in the summer of this year, 2005, I believe the year is that we're now in. And, and writing for the stage is something I think we'll do more of. Because it's, besides everything else, it's the incredible luxury for a TV writer that you might do something twice. You know, we've never done anything twice. You know, you do it, uh, if you do um, a really good episode of a, of a TV series, you really enjoy it, and the audience, if it's in a studio, love it, or if it's a, you know, a drama, you know, whatever. But then, the next day, that's history, sit down, read the new script, worry about the new script, do the new script, week after week after week, that's what a series is. The idea that you write something, you make it the best thing it can be, put it in front of an audience who actually pay money to go in and watch it and buy an ice cream, and then they love it, and then at the end of the show you can say to the director, I just think if Fred had come in like one second later on that line, it would have been even better. And tomorrow, Fred can come in one second later on that line. I so think I think theatre was something we were always thinking about. But in our twenty, well, certainly twenty years of um, of writing endless series, back to back series, from from holding the fort, the very first thing we did, through to believe nothing, which was two o two. Uh, there was always a desire to write for the theatre, much more in my case than Morris's, I think, than film. Film didn't excite me nearly as much as theatre, for the reasons Morris has explained, because 
it was lovely to be able to go in on Wednesday night and see a completely different performance than the one you saw last Saturday. And then you realised um, you're at the wrong theatre. Indeed, when we created Good Night Sweetheart as a, 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 a scene, that's really what we're talking about. I remember turning to Morris and saying, I think this would make a damn good stage musical because you have all the music from the period, um, which is already written for you, and a fabulous story, good characters, that you could put this on the stage. And I wouldn't be entirely surprised that were in the years ahead for you to see in the West End a good night sweetheart musical. Good night, sweetheart, sweetheart.